get involved with what we did early. And I was talking to someone today saying the, the very pure uh, Melville Society uh, types really don't love these abridged books. But the thing that's wonderful about abridged books is it brings this really great to the court.
put on quite the show while talking over one another. I was very entertained. After dinner, I waited in the lounge area with the landlord. I was still curious about my missing roommate. Where could this man be? I asked the landlord. Does he always stay out this late? Oh no, the landlord said. He usually in, he's usually in early and up early. I guess he's having trouble selling his wares. His wares? What do you mean? I asked. Trinkets, breads, and treasures, and the like that he's brought back from the voyages. The landlord said, this town is full of such stuff, though. Too many sailors trying to sell things. Do you think he's still trying to sell them at this hour? I asked. It was already midnight. Hard to say, he replied. He's never been this late. Might not return at all, I suppose. With that, we decided it was time for bed. The landlord took me upstairs to the room and let me in. The bed was quite large and would certainly fit two men comfortably. I was still worried about sharing the bed with a strange man, but decided the landlord was right in guessing he was gone for the night. Even though I was quite tired, I tossed and turned for some time before falling asleep. Then, just after drifting off, I was awoken by footsteps in the hall. I lay quietly in the bed as the door opened. A large man stood in the door frame. He walked in and set his candle down in the corner of the room. I said hello so he would know I was in the room. He did not reply. When he turned to look at me, I saw his face in the candlelight. My word, I have never seen anything like it. At first, I thought he had been in a fight. His face looked blackened and bruised. It took me a moment to realize that they were tattoos. Black squares of ink decorated his entire face. He took off his fur cap and laid down. When he took his shirt off, I saw that his body was covered in the same tattoos. I thought of escaping the window. I thought of escaping the window of what we were on the second floor. Also, I was not a coward. I had never seen a man like this before, but that was no reason to be afraid. That is until he started to attack me. He suddenly jumped onto the bed. He began to push and poke at me. I struggled to get free. Who are you? He grunted. Tell me who you are. I called for the landlord. Peter Coffin, come quickly. This man is attacking me. In only a few moments, the landlord was at the door with his candle. There's no need for this fuss, the landlord said. Free quick won't harm a hair on her head. Not harm a hair, I shouted. Look at him, he's trying to hurt me. But even as I said the words, I noticed that Peter was sitting back quietly against the wall. He was smiling to himself. I started to feel embarrassed that I had caused such a disturbance. I'm sorry that you were surprised by Peter, the landlord said. I thought you understood he was a native from New Zealand. He's a good fellow. He won't try to scare you again, will you, Peter? No, the harpooner said. No more troubles. Now get back to bed, he said to me. It's time for sleep. I quickly realized that I had been unfair. I had made, made too many quick judgments about this man. He put on a show because he knew I was frightened by his appearance. He had no intention of hurting me. We both turned in, and I never had a better night of sleep in my life. Do you want to go? Would you like to have a minute to think before you come up? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up the next morning feeling rested and refreshed. Queek, Queekly woke, woke me up at the same time. I watched him rush at the basin, then dress, then dress. He put on his waistcoat and hat. Then, taking his harpoon, he left the room and I I followed him shortly after. All the other guests at breakfast, at the breakfast table, were whalers. This time, they all sat quietly and ate. I thought this was very funny, as sailors were known to be loud and talk talkative. Perhaps that was only when at sea or just back from the long voyage.
Kui Kui sat on the head of the table. He ate nothing but meat. No rolls, no butter, just meat. After breakfast, I went into the parlor. I went outside for a stroll. I had never been to New Bedford before. It was, it, I was surprised by all the different people. There were men of almost every color, and people seemed to wear whatever they wanted. One man was a people hat, a fancy wicked coat, and a wide belt with a knife stuck down on one side. I gave my way to, to a chapel. I am a Christian, but, but do not make it to church every day, every Sunday. It is hard to keep a routine when I am stuck at sea so often. The sermon was just about to start. I to start. I sat down among sailors, sailors' wives, and sailors' with, with widows, and waited. All around the chapel, there were play cues. These signs were put up in memory of sailors who had died at sea. They were donated by their families and shipmates. I looked to my left. I was surprised to see Queequeg sitting down the road from me. I I knew that he was not a Christian. A Christian. He carried a little pagan doll with him that he prayed to. I had seen it with him in the hotel room. Queequeg nodded. Then when he saw me, then he went back to to waiting patiently for this sermon to begin. The minister walked to the front of of the chapel. Father Maple was a, an older man. He was very tall and had a mane of, of wild gray hair. He was well known as a former will and harpooner. I had heard talk of him from the other whalers before I, I arrived. Father Maple climbed a ladder to reach the pulpit. He, he did this slowly and with traumatic flair. When he reached the top, he dragged the ladder up. Now no one could climb up and he could not climb down. He looked like a sailor in the crow's nest, high, high top of the mast of the ship. Father Maple called the room into order. Gangway to starboard. Midships, midships. He was using the language that sailors use on a ship. He was telling the crowd to move in from the sides to take their seats. Just a Father Maple began to speak. A ter terrible storm started outside. Wind and rain whipped against the windows. The minister was not bothered, though his voice was calm and strong. No one else bothered of, about the weather either. They were only concerned with Father Maple's words. He told the story of Jonah in the belly, Jonah in the belly of the whale. The whale. You know it from the Bible, he said to the crowd. You've heard the story, but but have you listened to the words? He recounted how Jonah did not want to solve God's wishes. He tried to escape by, by ship when terrible storms arose. The crew got realized it was Jonah causing the problems. He was thrown overboard and swallowed by a whale. Jonah, Jonah did not pray for, for immediate delivery. He knew that his punishment was was just he had he had seen and needed time time in this whale prison. He knew that he would be saved if God believed he deserved it. Then the minister wanted everyone to understand that if he did sin and they should try to try not to they should repent like Jonah. The men in the chapel understood how they understood how hard they were. They 
your Christian world is very different than, from mine. Then he asked what brought me to New Bedford. I told him that I had decided to try my hand at Wailing. I had been to see
Yeah, sure. <laughs> the chapter five of the people. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop Steve. I'm going to look at the end. I think she's going to.